I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Washington Post, and I'm going to moderate uh, this afternoon's discussion of Gaza. Uh, our discussion of Gaza follows a war there that has reminded all of us of the burden of history uh, in the Middle East and also has reminded all of us of the fragility of the peace process. Tonight, I hope we'll put a little more substance to that process by discussing where we go now, how we put the pieces back together. We have a most distinguished panel to discuss these issues with us tonight. Let me first briefly introduce them. Uh, to my immediate right is the Prime Minister of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, to his left uh, is the President of Israel, Shimon Peres. To his left is the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. And to his left uh, is the Secretary General of the Arab League, Amr Musa. I'm going to ask uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon from the United Nations, who has been particularly focused on the humanitarian aspects of the Gaza crisis to lead off tonight uh, with his remarks uh, for the next five minutes. Secretary General. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, Excellencies. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure uh, to take part in this very important uh, discussions on the Middle East uh, peace process. The watchword of this uh, Davos Forum uh, seems to be a crisis. A multiple crisis. We have been talking about financial crisis, climate crisis, food crisis, energy crisis. But to over 1.5 million Palestinians in Gaza, these crises seem to be a distant one, considering and comparing to their daily crisis, they have to endure, they have to suffer, uh, particularly after this uh, three-week-long military conflict and until continuing uh, until today. This is very sad. When I visited Gaza, I saw myself, the level of uh, destruction, the level of uh, tragic difficulty these people have to endure uh, because of this uh, uh, crisis. I came back with a strengthened uh, resolve as a Secretary General of the United Nations that I must do uh, urgently to help uh, these people in alleviating the sufferings of these uh, humanitarian uh, issues. This morning, I issued an urgent appeal amounting to uh, $613 million uh, for an immediate urgent humanitarian assistance as well as early uh, recovery. We are now talking about uh, mid- and long-term uh, reconstruction. These are what uh, I'd like to uh, discuss with you. Now, I have four priorities. I think it is not me as a Secretary General. It's a whole international community uh, must address four priority issues uh, in addressing this uh, Middle East peace process uh, comprehensively. Two are immediate and urgent uh, crisis. Uh, priority issues, that is how to make this ceasefire a durable and sustainable and which can be respected by all the parties concerned. This ceasefire, unilaterally declared, is very fragile, as we have seen uh, two days ago. One Israeli uh, soldier was killed near the Rafah uh, crossing. So any time a small incident even can, be, can broke, break this uh, ceasefire, there must be international communities' uh, focused efforts to prevent any smuggling of uh, illicit weapons and uh, arms into Gaza. And Israeli government must open all the crossings to allow the free and smooth flow of humanitarian assistance, and other reconstruction uh, materials. These are very important uh, to, to make this ceasefire 
a durable and sustainable one. There is very urgent humanitarian issues, the schools and roads, electricity and sanitation and sewages, they have all been destroyed. People have lost their beloved families, their friends, and more than 5,000 people have been wounded with 1,300 people killed. This is a human tragedy. I visited the United Nations compound, which has been bombed by uh, Israeli forces uh, attack. This was a very shocking and alarming, and which was unacceptable. Now, these are two most urgent priority issues which we have to tackle. The remaining two issues are relating to mid- and long-term process. That is, unity of Palestinians. With this division of Palestinian people living in both in Gaza and West Bank, divided into Fatah and Hamas, it will be very difficult for international community to see the smooth reconstruction, smooth well-being of a Palestinian people. This is very sad, and I think, I hope that Arab countries, all Arab countries, now we have a Secretary General of League of Arab States here, to facilitate this unity of Palestinians in a united way. The fourth priority, this is a fundamental one. This is a peace process. On an urgent basis, this Middle East peace process should be put on track. In that regard, I am very much encouraged by new President of the United States, President Obama, who has already taken very swift, decisive measures by appointing special envoy, Senator George Mitchell. He is now already uh, traveling in the region. Israelis and Palestinians, they have achieved substantial progress during last year. They must build upon on this uh, progress thus far uh, made. I would strongly urge the United Nations will continue to participate and support that. Now then, how to ensure all this peace process to make this durable? Hamas must stop rocket firing, must not provoke Israelis. And Israelis should take maximum restraint to keep this uh, peace process, very fragile process. Since the break of this uh, crisis, I have been phoning and meeting the leaders of the region and international community, including three distinguished leaders sitting together with us. It has been very difficult. But United Nations cannot do it alone. Whole international community, particularly whole Arab countries and leaders of uh, major countries, particularly United States, they should take a leadership role. And we must engage in Middle East peace process on an urgent and immediate uh, basis. And I would again urge at this time to international donors to be generously and positively providing a necessary uh, fine, uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General Bond. <laughs> Let me turn now to Prime Minister Erdogan from Turkey. Uh, Prime Minister, your government has been playing a key role as intermediary in indirect negotiations between Israel and Syria, uh, which were uh, pushing ahead when the Gaza war began. Let me put to you the same question that I, I put to the, to the Secretary General of the United Nations and, and I want all of our guests to, to address, and that is what specifically needs to be done to prevent the Middle East peace process from slipping back yet again? Öncelikle 
first of all before replying to the question as to what needs to be done i think it's also important that we analyze the current situation because we need to do a proper analysis of the current situation in order to determine what steps need to be taken I'm not going to start from 40 years ago in making the situation analysis. I'm just going to go for as far back as June 2008. If we look at uh, back then, June 2008, there was a, a ceasefire which was um, stated, agreed to, and uh, there was no problem to the cease uh, fire that was uh, to last for six months. But when the cease fire ended uh, six months later, uh, there were no rocket attacks at that point. In the meantime, the Israeli side was to lift the uh, embargo, the um, a situation uh, had to change in Palestine. However, the uh, Palestinian territories is like um, an open air prison because it is completely isolated from the rest of the world. So it is very much isolated, sealed. So it, if you tried to bring in a case of tomatoes from any crossing into the Palestinian territories, uh, you must get the permission of the Israeli side because it is not possible otherwise. So looking at this, I look at this from a humanitarian point of view. And I also will say a few words as Prime Minister. I visited Israel um, some time ago, and then I w went to uh, Palestine. And as the pre Prime Minister, I waited for a half hour with my wife uh, in the car for about half an hour to be able to cross into the Palestinian territories from Ramallah. But never has a diplomat coming from Israel had to wait uh, for that long at our borders. I think we have to uh, look at these aspects of uh, the situation there on the ground. Also, I also asked Mr. Olmert whether there were any deaths as a result of these rocket attacks, and he told me that there were no deaths, but that the attacks were a fact. Uh, so they are being, uh, the, the, these rockets are um, being used, but uh, they don't kill anyone. So I'm told that uh, it's about uh, the rockets themselves, and they are not. Uh, very good quality. But in the meantime, there were more than 24 uh, Palestinians who were killed um, during the ceasefire uh, since last June. And uh, power was cut off. Uh, there was no food. Uh, electricity didn't exist in hospitals. So there were quite a number of difficult issues. And we had already started as Turkey to send humanitarian aid. Uh, to uh, Palestine. So there was already a humanitarian issue then. And let me say that uh, I have always been a leader who has expressly stated that anti-Semitism is a crime against humanity. Islamophobia, too, is a crime against humanity. For me, uh, the person being Christian, Jewish, or Muslim is not important if the person is under stress. To me, the common denominator is that they are all human beings. And so my approach is a humanitarian one, and that has been what uh, I have uh, taken as the basis of my uh, efforts. Uh, for example, we tried to send uh, humanitarian aid, the Turkish Red Crescent, uh, tried to provide aid, but uh, it took quite a while, two weeks sometimes, to uh, have the uh, trucks cross the crossings. Uh, I don't know if President Perez is aware of this, but it's taken us quite a lot of time. Our diplomats have had to work very hard to make sure that the aid would flow into the Palestinian territories. Even more interesting, 
uh, is that uh, the Israeli Prime Minister was in Turkey, Mr. Olmert was in Turkey four days before uh, the war in Gaza started. As you have mentioned, uh, we as Turkey have taken up a, an intermediation role between Israel and Syria for indirect talks, and there were already four rounds of talks in, uh, which had taken place, indirect talks. And the fifth round was actually carried out uh, with Pres Prime Minister Olmert and myself present and our special envoys present in Ankara. And we sat together for about five to six hours and uh, we were discussing uh, the issues between uh, Syria and Israel. Uh, we were on phone conversation. I was on phone conversation with President Assad, and my envoy was talking to the foreign minister, Muallim. And uh, our goal then was to see if we could move to the next phase, which was direct talks between Israel and Syria. So that was what we were trying to do. And our goal in trying to do all this has been to achieve peace in the region, and uh, we have been trying to bring together officials from two countries which to date uh, had not come together. And we were making quite good progress, so much so that there were, we were having problems with a few words only in the um, language that we were talking. And uh, it was decided that a few days should uh, lapse until a final decision could be reached. And in the meantime, I was talking to Mr. Olmert with uh, my foreign minister with me and uh, our envoy, special envoy, and uh, Prime Minister Olmert had his advisor as well. And uh, I said that we could work to release the captured Israeli soldier who's held by Hamas. Uh, but I said that, uh, and I also made a request, I said that the Reform and Change Party won the election uh, in Palestine. We're talking about democracy. We would like to see democracy take root. So if we would like to see democracy take root, then we must respect, first of all, uh, the people who have received the votes of uh, the people that um, of the country that they are running in. So we, we may not like them, but we have to respect the process. And I said uh, to Prime Minister Olmert that uh, they held the uh, ministers, members of parliament uh, of Palestine, and I suggested also that uh, there could perhaps be a gesture made, similar to the gesture made to uh, President Abbas before, and uh, they could be released perhaps. Uh, but. Uh, um, Prime Minister Olbert said, Olmert said that this would make things very difficult for uh, President Abbas. Uh, but then I said perhaps it would be possible to release some of the women and children. And uh, that could perhaps be done as a gesture. And Prime Minister Olmert told me that he would talk to his colleagues and uh, respond back the next day. But uh, we got no response. And in about four days after that, by December 27th, we saw the war in Gaza. What happened was more than 1,200 people were killed, uh, including women, children. More than 5,000 were wounded. And this was a disproportionate use of force. So if you look at all this from a humanitarian point of view, and think of uh, the military power of Israel, including weapons of mass destruction, uh, and whether or not there is anything that is uh, similar in Gaza, whether Palestinians have any of that kind of uh, military uh, power. They, re they don't have that kind of power. The uh, UN Security Council met uh, and uh, a resolution was announced, but uh, Israel did not recognize this resolution of the United Nations Security Council. As Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, mentioned, the uh, UN Center was also hit uh, during the course of this um, war, and schools, mosques were also hit. But mankind or humanity as a whole did not really act as quickly as they should have in trying to help the people there. In the case of Georgia, for example, people acted rather quickly. I include ourselves in that effort because we too worked very hard to help Georgians as well in a difficult time. So 
uh, Hamas must be considered in this process. And if Turkey uh, is asked to play some sort of a role, uh, we uh, too would be willing to be involved. But we must. Uh, be careful and we must think of the whole process when we try to define the parties involved. Uh, and we must definitely achieve peace in the Middle East because that is important and necessary for global peace. If uh, the Middle East peace process does not yield a positive result, that, that means that we will not have peace in the world as a whole. So I think that uh, in the national unity government to be established in Palestine, this uh, party of reform and change um, must be there. And that's, that is how the national unity government has to be established. Then elections has to take, have to take place. And once a new government is in place, uh, whether or not we like them, will be the government, should be the government of the Palestinian people, people because we have to respect the will of the Thank you, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, for a very uh, comprehensive and, and I must say, uh, quite newsy uh, uh, response. Let me turn now to Secretary General Amr Musa and the same question, how do we put this peace process back together after Gaza? And perhaps you could uh, address the two things that Secretary General Ban uh, focused on. First, how to achieve unity among the Palestinians, and second, uh, what this new American administration can most usefully do as George Mitchell begins making his way around the region. Well, thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking the Secretary General of the United Nations for the uh, forceful position he has taken and for the actions he is calling for in order to save the situation in Gaza, to save Gaza after the carnage that has been committed against its people. Also, I wish to commend the role played by Turkey, a very positive, courageous, and clear role that Turkey, a member of the Middle East family of nations, want to help establish peace and to help deal with the major mistakes that have been committed uh, against the Palestinians and to ask for, work for, a fair, a just peace in order for peace to be durable. Now, David, you asked me to talk about the future and how we would address it. This cannot make me sweep things under the, under the carpet, things that belong to the near future and also to perhaps distant future. The situation in Gaza was not a reaction. The assault against the Gazans was not just a reaction for some rockets being launched. Uh, uh, against southern Israel. And here I would open some brackets to say that we are against any thing that would affect children, women, civilians, be them Palestinians or Israelis. And then continue to say that this situation in Gaza and in Palestine it, it is a situation of foreign military occupation. So people in and siege and blockade. Gaza is living within a blockade, a very severe one. The West Bank is under military occupation with barriers, with colonies, that settlements. So the Palestinians are trying to express themselves to find a future for themselves. You cannot ask people in Gaza living in starvation and hunger because of the blockade, the very sinister blockade, and then ask them to be calm and ask them why do you throw stones against your occupiers. It is against the nature of people, against the nature of people. You strangle them, you starve them, and then ask them to be quiet. And then, as has been discussed now, the question of smuggling. Of course, smuggling is illegal, illicit uh, uh, trade and illicit uh, movement of, uh, of things, uh, commodities and so on, including perhaps uh, arms. You strangle them, not a single window of opportunity, and then talk to them about illicit trade. If you want to prevent this, you have to open the 
crossing points. You have to give them food. You have to give them water to give them medicine. It is a miserable life that the Palestinians have lived and until now are living in Gaza because of the blockade that Israel has imposed on them for three years now. Number two, another fact. The Palestinians believed the call for democracy. There was some policies, international policies at certain time, calling on the Middle East, apply democracy. Democracy is the solution for everything, and it happens that I agree with that. The Palestinians believed the advice, ran elections, Hamas won, and half an hour, 25 minutes after the announcement of, of the results of the election, Hamas was served notice that aid will be suspended, and then came the blockade, a severe blockade, and hence Hamas was put on the defensive. But very much as Prime Minister Erdogan has said, the people in Gaza are not only Hamas, it is such, it's only an organization among other organizations, but the people, one and a half million people of women, of children, of old people, they were attacked and they paid the price for this game that is going on between Israel, Hamas, and the game that has been caused, as is being caused until now by the military occupation. Why Hamas was listened to in the occupied territories, in the, uh, within the Palestinian ranks, in the Middle East, within the Arab world, why? Because it has a logic. They said, all right, President Abu Mazen, go and negotiate. And if there is something useful coming out of your negotiations, we will certainly support you. And in fact, they are on record as having said, we are ready to accept a Palestinian state within the borders of 1967, but we are not going to sign any paper until we see what is the result of that. So, President Abu Mazen didn't bring anything. Did not bring anything out of one full year of negotiations with the current Israeli government. That is what he said. He is on record as having said that. And in fact, he said it on this stage last year. I believe it was uh, the Prime Minister Salam Fayyad. So this is the situation. It is not a question of Israel reacting to some rockets. It is much deeper than that. It is an action of occupation, an action of blockade, then a reaction of resistance, then the reaction of destruction carried out by Israel. Okay, that has happened. Are we going to stop here and the end of the world will occur? No. Perhaps all of us now are called upon to save the situation. As the Secretary General has just said, there are three or four things that have to be done. A ceasefire, a strong ceasefire, sustainable ceasefire, opening of the uh, crossings, stopping the illicit uh, traffic and the conciliation between the Palestinians. That we have to do. And I want you to know that I do not absolve ourselves on the Arab side from also committing mistakes. But no mistakes, no mistake we have committed can compete with the major mistake that has been committed by Israel in destroying Gaza and killing all those people in only 20 days. Again, we try to involve the United Nations rather than to involve shooting and more bloodshed. Unfortunately, in the last several years, up until this January, and it was before January 20th, the philosophy was, no, keep the Security Council away. Give Israel the chance to reach, to do what they were set to do. We have witnessed that back in 2006 in Lebanon and we witnessed that back this January in New York. But this is a long story. I don't think the time will allow us to do so, to, to explain it in full. Now, what should we do? We have a new administration in the United States. What President Obama has said is reassuring. Change. He addressed the Arab world through one of our major channels called Al Arabiya from Dubai addressed us and talked to us. We listened, we heard, we understood. He sent his special envoy, Senator Mitchell, who is a very reasonable man, 
we discussed with him, we are going to discuss again with him, and I believe there are those prospects of the United States returning back to the role of honest broker, which we missed for the last several years. This is a key point for the future, that the United States gets back to the role of honest broker that listens to this side and say, yes, you are right on this, but you are wrong on that, and to the other side too, the same. This we have not seen in the last several years. Okay, now this is the first positive point. We hope that we are right in our assessment and in our uh, hopes. The second is the Arab Initiative. We are ready, formally, officially, at the highest level, all of us are committed to establish peace with Israel, to recognize Israel, to normalize with Israel, and to carry on all our commitments in accordance with Security Council resolutions, the Madrid conference decisions, and whatever agreements we have signed with, or that has been signed between any Arab country and Israel. We are ready for that. But the point is that we have not received any answer from Israel for the last seven years. President Perez is a very eloquent man. He says that we accept, but this is just a good expression of words. There is no authorized decision taken by the government of Israel to respond to the most authorized message sent by an Arab summit held back in 2002. So our position is fully authorized. We haven't gotten any answer, any answer whatsoever, except some utterances here. We read it in some newspapers or translation from them. So we call on Israel now. What is your position on this initiative? Formal position, formal position, not just a statement here, formal position, as our position also was formal. If there is an acceptance, authorized acceptance by Israel, then we are on the right track. Therefore, the second point is for us to receive a formal reply about the acceptance of the Arab initiative, which calls on us Arabs to turn the page, turn the page of the conflict, recognize Israel, normalize with Israel, and have Israel as part of the family of nations in the Middle East, which until now Israel is not. But if Israel also withdraws, allows the Palestinian uh, state to be established, withdraws from the other territories, we see no obstacle for us and for the Israelis to live together and have, uh, get our act together. When are we going to receive this message? A question mark. The third point. But, Secretary General, okay. if, if we, are, we have a chance to get a, a response from the President of Israel, then maybe this is a good time to do that since we're running short of time. I know that the President is going to take all his time. So you give me two more minutes, please. I don't want a bargain. <laughs> we are, no, no. Have we, we, we will be but all ears to listen to uh, President Pence. Well, well, let's do, let's do rep, uh, rep. Now, now, the year 2009, we lived the year 2008 with a lot of promises and it ended up in a bloodshed. For us to move from an administration to the other, from the year 2000 to the year 2000, uh, 2008, then 2009, then 2010, then 2011. This is a gimmick that we are not going to accept. That is why. Now, we are in 2009. If there is real intention, the real work done by the honest broker, the political will will be expressed by Israel in favor of peace, and progress will be done, will be made, then we are on the right track. If this year ends, we reach the, the, the day 31st of December, as we did in 2008, without any result, then we'll have to reconsider. There are a lot of other alternatives, but I believe in what Turkey is saying and the, uh, Prime Minister Raghav Erdogan said, we cannot reach and Israel cannot reach any of its goals through military means. We need to have a political settlement, but a fair one, and in the year 2009. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, Secretary General Moussa. And now, uh, President Perez of Israel, no one has worked uh, longer or harder on this thing we call the peace process than you have. 
and uh, tell us how you how you think we can put it back together. Thank you. <laughs> Helpful. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I heard the distinguished speakers talking about Israel, and they couldn't recognize the picture of the country that they know. I want to tell at the beginning, it's very difficult when a democratic country has to confront an illegal terrorist group. Whatever we do, is being photographed. Whatever they do, nobody sees. For example, when you throw a rocket on a settlement in Israel, it's not being photographed. You cannot see the mother trying to defend her child the whole night and have a sleepless night. Did you ever saw on television a sleepless night? I have much respect to you, Mr. Prime Minister, but I must put things as they really are. Let me start with democracy, first of all. Who was elected by the Palestinians? Not Hamas, but Mr. Abbas, who is called Abu Mazen. 62% of the Palestinians voted for him to be the president of the Palestinian people. And we negotiate with him. Hamas participated in the elections but they have a very unique idea about democracy. They think a democracy is a story of one day in four years. You go through the elections. After the elections, you can start to shoot and kill and threaten. Finished. Democracy is not a matter of elections. It is a civilization. And uh, I want to contradict your words by quoting from the Hamas, I, I wouldn't go into inner Arab uh, stories, but Hamas concerns us. Hamas published a charter. Let me just read two lines, three lines from it, from the Hamas charter. The day of judgment will not come about until the Muslims kill the Jews, when the Jews will hide behind stones and trees. There is no solution for peace initiative, proposals, international conferences are all a waste of time. This is an official charter. I don't know about which Hamas are you talking. Now, about the proportions. In the last eight years, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but since you mentioned it, let me give the other picture too. Israel lost 1,167 1, lives from terrorists. 8,500 were wounded. It wasn't done in 20 days. It was done in several years. We restrained all the time. And then, since the last four years, when Hamas took over Gaza, 5,500 rockets and 4,000 mortars, shells, were fired upon civilian life in Israel at random. They didn't care if it's kindergarten, if it's... A, we didn't answer. For that reason, the ceasefire idea, Mr. Prime Minister, was very strange in our use. We never started fire. And we told the Palestinians time and again, don't fire, there won't be fire. We are not two equal parties at all. We never started, and who renewed, who broke. By the way, we didn't have a formal agreement about the ceasefire. They announced, and the Palestinians said, it's over. No, they broke it. And when the Prime Minister was at your place at, uh, four days before the, uh, the operation started, the government of Israel didn't yet decide to take actions against it. Now let me, I want you to listen because you watch all of your television, I can understand your feeling. Israel left Gaza completely, no occupation. 
we took out all of our soldiers from Gaza, all our civilians. People are talking about settlements. We took out from Gaza all the settlements and all the settlers, 15,000 of them. Nobody forced us. It was our own choice. We have had to mobilize 45,000 policemen to bring them back home at the cost of two and a half billion dollars. I want to understand why did they fight rockets against us? What for? There was not any siege against Gaza. All the passages were open. Not only that, we participated in investing money in Gaza to develop a, an agriculture. We have a Paris Center. We ourselves put in $20,000, $20 million, sorry, to build greenhouses to develop strawberries, the export of strawberries, excellent strawberries, flowers. Jimmy Wolfenson, who was a representative of the quartet, took from his own pocket $5 million also to participate in it. They destroyed it. Why? They bombed all the passages. Why? Why did they fire at us? What did they want? We didn't occupy. There was never a day of starvation in Gaza. By the way, Israel is the supplier of water daily to Gaza. Israel is the supplier of fuel to Gaza. The only thing we didn't permit to bring in is rockets from Iran. And they build tunnels to do it. And, you know, we also have women and children, and they want to sleep at night. You know what it means? Every day, almost 100 rockets falling at random. A million people have had to be under shelter. They came to the government and said, what, what happened to you? We want to have security. Why do you permit to happen it? And I want anybody telling me clearly what were the reasons for the attack. What were the purposes of the attack? Peace. We made peace with Egypt. Not by arms, by agreement and negotiation. And we met all the requests of Egypt. We made peace with Jordan, the same. We gave back all the land, all the water. We opened with the Palestinians and we told them that we are for a Palestinian state. I started in Oslo against a majority, maybe, of our people who didn't agree. And all the time, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, why you have had to wait? Because many buses that came from the West Bank to Jerusalem were full of dynamite. I was then Prime Minister, I saw it with my own eyes, the blood and the bodies. You know, I don't have to watch television. And when I came in, there were thousands of people shouting at me, traitor, killer, look what you did to us. You must. There are many details that you have to know. Israel is 60 years old. Do you know any other country that in 60 years has had to go through seven wars, two intifadas, an ongoing boycott? What? Why? And in spite of it, we made peace with Egypt. I have the highest respect for President Mubarak, by the way. President Mubarak accused Hamas, not us. And President Mubarak knows the situation, not less than you, Mr. Prime Minister. And President Abbas knows the situation, not less than you do. And he accused Hamas, not us. And then mothers and children came to the government and said, what will happen? A million people every night have had to hide themselves in shelters. Mothers with sleepless nights. What do you really mean? By the way, I never saw anybody demonstrating against those missiles. That was okay. Nobody said a word. And we didn't answer. A day in, a day out, a year in, a year out. There is a limit to it. And by the way, and I have much respect also for the Secretary General, who used to be, and we hope, I hope, is still friend. I appreciate very much the Arab initiative. But there is a problem in it, and I don't want to hide it. The problem is not the Arab world. 
The problem is the Iranian ambition to govern the Middle East. They supplied the rockets to Hezbollah. They supplied the rockets to Hamas. They are controversial in the Arab making. And you know what? We didn't have a choice. We, the leader of Hezbollah, Nasrallah, says, would I know that Israel will react so strongly, we wouldn't start it. Thank you very much. And then come uh, Mashal, the leader of uh, Hamas, and said, Israel reacted too strongly. What did he expect us to do? I don't understand. What would any country do? What would you do if you would have on Istanbul every night 10 rockets or 100 rockets? And we never gave up. All my life, as you said, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate I'm fighting for peace. What we did is not we, the thing that we wanted to do. It's not our choice. Our choice is peace. What we did is because the lack of a choice. We weren't left with a choice. Would you go for such a convention to kill the Jews? Okay, those are words. But to kill the Jews and send rockets to kill them. What do you want us to do? I started to negotiate with Mr. Arafat. I must respect. It wasn't simple. The PLO was at the beginning a terroristic organization. Mr. Arafat agreed to stop terror and go to negotiations. By the way, whatever was achieved peace, whatever was achieved positively was achieved not by rockets, not by force, not by power, but by negotiation. It takes time, it takes time. It's a very complicated country. It's a small country with three religions, with a lot of history, with different ethnic, ethnicities. It's not simple. We made peace once, twice. Now we are negotiating with the Palestinians. There was a crisis among the Palestinians. We don't intend to be the one that decides if the Palestinians will be united or not. As long as Hamas did not rebel against the Fatah, it wasn't our business. We didn't say a word. You know what? I'm, I'm talking about Israel. Look what the people of the Palestinian people, the Secretary General of Fatah is saying about Hamas three days ago. His name is Asar Abed Rabu a person that they know and respect, who is the Secretary General of the PLO, Executive Committee. And I quoted him. I quote him three days ago. Hamas has turned Gaza, Gaza schools, mosques, all universities into centers of detention, interrogation, and torture. And torture. Doesn't have been shot in the legs, beaten savagely, and had their bones broken, Hamas only to support, have uh, broken. Hamas plundered trucks, bringing and distributes it only to the, the food, only to the supporters of their movement. They didn't give food to the people of Fatah. They killed 100 leaders of Fatah in full daylight. They throw them from the roofs. What do we really mean? Is that a matter of definitions? Israel does not want to shoot anybody. For us, all children are in, as important as one can think of. I created a Paris Center. All the money we have collected went to the cure of children, Palestinian children. They didn't have insurance, they didn't have hospitals. In five years, we brought to Israel 5,500 Palestinian children and their mothers to be cured. By the way, there is no hospital today in Israel that doesn't have Arab doctors. So the children could have communicated with the doctors in the Israeli hospitals. That is our choice, to touch a child. But if you put, a chi if you put bombs in a kindergarten, and if you hide yourself behind innocent families, and before we, shall, we sh 
we tried to sell anybody, we telephoned the people. We said, please leave the place. We don't want to hurt you. We made during the, those 20 days 250,000 telephone calls before we shoot. What could we do? What was our choice? And what would any government do? I'm very much sorry, Mr. Secretary General, about the United Nations uh, building. According to our record, they start, not, not by your knowledge, they started to shoot from there. And by the way, there, when you bombed, you bombed Kosovo, you hit the Chinese embassy. Did you want to? And hundreds of uh, civilian people were killed in the bombing, too. Let's, okay. So, please, I want to speak clearly. Israel does not need a ceasefire because we never started a bullet. And we shall never do it. And the minute they'll stop shooting, there will be a ceasefire. We don't need anything else. Every moment, every day, we are not interested in fire. We are not interested in hurting or killing anybody. Now about the peace process. First of all, I want to say that it was a great move on the side of the Secretary General of the Arab League to introduce the Arab Initiative. I think that was a very positive move in a bitter history of misunderstanding and confrontations. The problems we were facing were the following. A, we started to negotiate directly with the Palestinians. President Mubarak told me, look, finish your negotiations with the Palestinians, we shall consider as the first move to an overall peace. We are negotiating, and I think we made headway in an extremely complicated issue. Take only the issue of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not a piece of land. Jerusalem is fire. There are three different religions, and there are different streams in every religion, and people are fighting about every window, every door. It's easy to say, make an agreement. We are trying to find a way. We told the Palestinians that we are ready really to accept 242 and 338, which means really to return most, almost all of the land of the West Bank to them. Gaza we left completely. What, what, what is there to fight? So the ceasefire is, as far as it is concerned, is not a problem for us. We never start, we shall never start fire. And when we, they fired against us, we replied, but after a great restraint and thousands of people were killed too. They weren't killed in a concentrated manner, so what? Doesn't matter. Now I think what we have to do, and by the way, I am for the restoration of Gaza. We have nothing, there wasn't a day that we didn't supply water and oil. There wasn't that I personally read every week a report about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. If something is missing, the government and myself, we are intervening to make sure there will be enough food and fuel. And food. The tragedy of Gaza is not Israel. It's Hamas, who created a dictatorship, a very ugly one. And they build the problem of the crossing now or is not because we want to control the supply of food or building material or medical. They build uh, tunnels to bring in those missiles. And they build an underground system of tunnels where, by the way, the leaders hide themselves there and they forgot the people. I think, yes. We would like to see Gaza flourishing. Gaza is a small place with an intelligent people. When we started to talk with Mr. Arafat, we took as an example Singapore. Gaza, together with the West Bank, are nine times larger than Singapore. In Singapore, there are more people than in Gaza in the West Bank. Today, the problem is not land, but really education. 
And Gaza is not our enemy, and the people in Gaza are not our enemies. And we want to live with them in peace. We don't have hatred, and we don't have plans. For that reason, we left Gaza. And we are for restoring the life in Gaza, but without dictators and without shooting, not only us, but the people of Fatah. But and then Mr. President, we, want, we should just one minute, might end there. And uh, then we want to renew the negotiations with the authorized Palestinian Authority. We made headway. We want to start right away. We want to do it with the Quartet. We want to do it straight away. We don't want to waste time. Our aim is peace, not war. And when we win a war, we don't con consider it as a victory. For us, victory is peace, not war. We have power, we shall never use power unless we don't have another choice. And when we have a choice, we want peace. And I think that Hezbollah has learned a lesson. They stopped shooting. Nobody stopped them to shoot, but our reaction. I hope uh, Hamas will also have a lesson. They will stop shooting and start talking. Everything that we can achieve is by talking, not by shooting. And that was and that is, and that will remain, the position of Israel. Th thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> this, this has been a, a powerful uh, and passionate debate. Uh, it's a debate that could go on tonight for hours, but we've already gone uh, well past our, our, our closing time. I, I mean, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, we, I, I, with apologies to Prime Minister one minute, Erdogan. One minute. One minute. Uh, one minute. Well, you know. One minute. One minute. Okay. One minute. The, but, but I'm going to hold you to the one minute, please. President Perez. President Perez. President Perez, you were older than I am, and uh, you have a very strong voice. I feel that uh, you perhaps feel uh, a bit guilty, and that's why perhaps you, are, you have been so strong in your voice, so loud. Well, you kill people. I, you, I remember the children who died on beaches. And uh, I remember uh, two former prime ministers in your countries who, in your country, who said that they felt very uh, happy when they were able to enter Palestine on tanks. Now, those are former prime ministers who have said that they have been very. Uh, satisfied with themselves when uh, they entered uh, Palestinian territories on tanks. And uh, I find it very sad that people applaud um, what you have said, because uh, there have been many people who have been killed. And I think that it is very wrong, and it's not humanitarian to um, uh, applaud any actions which have had that kind of a result. I've taken many notes. Unfortunately, there is no time to respond to all of them. But I will just Say two, two things. We can't start. We bir, can't start the debate again, please. Bir, we just don't have bir, time. Excuse me. Bir, uh, sözümü kesmeyin. Please let me finish. Geez, we really, we, we really do need to get people to dinner. Sixth commandment: Thou shalt not kill. But we are talking about killing. And second point. Gilad Atsamoni says that uh, uh, barbar Israeli barbar barbarianism is uh, way beyond what it should be. Then there is the international relations professor from Oxford University, Avishalom, has said this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I don't think I will come back to Davos after this. Thank you. Because you don't let me speak. Uh, the president spoke for 25 minutes. I have spoken only half of that. Uh, he's heard this 
over to our to our host, uh, Prime Minister. Do, do uh, ladies, Professor Schwab. S thank you, thank you very much. If you if you stay for one moment, for one minute, please. I think, despite all the emotions, and of course, when there is a question of lives of children and so on, we all have to be emotionally involved. But despite everything, I think we have heard also some reasons or some arguments which let us believe that there is a common ground. And I think the role of the United States as a honest broker, which was highlighted, is a very important one, and I'm happy that uh, Mrs. Jarrett uh, has participated and uh, certainly will bring back this message uh, to President Obama. Now, let me conclude this session on a conciliatory note. The World Economic Forum has as one of its communities the religious leaders, and we have here 20 high-level religious leaders representing all Abrahamic um, uh, 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 beliefs and religions. Let me just read what they have drafted as a message to you, as a message to those who negotiate. I read, the community of religious leaders associated with the World Economic Forum committed to justice, dignity, and mutual respect for all, expresses its deep distress at the pain of innocent suffering everywhere. In particular, the land that is holy to the Abrahamic religions to us has recently seen great death and destruction. While this conflict is a territorial conflict, all too often religion has been exploited and made part of the problem. Therefore, the community of religious leaders believes passionately that God said religion must be part of the solution. Indeed, no solution will be possible without such an engagement. Accordingly, the community of religious leaders calls on the political leadership to engage the religious representatives of all three Abrahamic faiths, specifically the Council of the Religious Leaders of the Holy Land, as partners, as true partners in the search for a settlement which will lead to two independent states living in peace and free from violence, incitement and terror. The community supports all initiatives to bring peace to the Middle East, the most recent of which is President Obama's appointment of a special envoy, Senator George Mitchell, for whose success we pray. Let's all pray for success because our fate and our children's fate will depend on the goodwill of those politicians to work together. And please join me by expressing your encouragement to everybody who is full of good faith and wants to negotiate to make sure that soon a dream can be fulfilled, a dream for just and sustained long-term peace. Thank you.